As an educator, I have always believed that television can be a powerful teaching tool. As producer and host of the first nationally broadcast television programs for pharmacists, pharmacy education on the air, and issues in pharmacy practice, I was able to develop my ideas on how the video medium can be used most effectively for continuing pharmacy education. Dr. Linda Bernstein, your host for Pharmacy Education on the Air. Today's broadcast marks the first presentation of pharmaceutical educational programming on Lifetime Medical Television. Welcome to the premier program of our new television series, Issues in Pharmacy Practice. I'm Dr. Linda Bernstein. This program marks a number of firsts. It is the first program in the first nationally televised educational series for pharmacists. It is the first nationally broadcast series produced by the School of Pharmacy at the University of California in San Francisco. And it is the first educational offering of the newly formed Pharmacy Council on Cholesterol a national coalition of pharmacy organizations devoted to professional and consumer cholesterol education. Now, does that say four times a day or once every four hours? And what about these vitamins my neighbor takes? Do you think they'd give me more energy? Mrs. Matthews, it sounds like we should take some time out this afternoon, sit down in a quiet place and go over each of the medications you've been taking. Can your daughter join us at three today? I think so. Today is her day off, and she has been concerned about me. I'll give her a call. Good. In the meantime, I'd like you to gather all the medications you have in the house, both prescription and over-the-counter, and put them in a bag. That way we can do a little inventory and make sure you're taking only the medications that you need. Hello, I'm Dr. Linda Bernstein, and welcome to this week's edition of Pharmacy Rounds. How can the pharmacist be cost conscious without sacrificing quality? Quality of care, quality of life, a concern for patient outcomes, and the need to evaluate the cost effectiveness of increasingly expensive pharmaceuticals. In this program, we'll look at that important question. Our topic is the new and fascinating field of pharmacoeconomics. We'll be talking to several experts to form a realistic picture of the cost of medical care, including drugs, and the means currently used to pay for it. Finally, we'll see how these issues impact on the practice of pharmacy. Dr. Herfindahl and his colleagues collected data over 27 months before, during, and after a period of clinical pharmacist intervention. What do all these patients have in common? All three are cancer patients who develop neutropenia and a greater risk of infection as a result of chemotherapy. Each benefited from colony-stimulating factors, new biotechnological agents that helped to increase their production of neutrophils and bring their white blood counts up closer to normal. Colony-stimulating factors are proteins that stimulate formation of blood cells during hematopoiesis and also affect mature cell function. Through recombinant DNA technology, a new source for these growth factors has recently become available. As they move from the laboratory to the clinical setting, they are likely to dramatically affect the fields of oncology, hematology, and infectious diseases. 
The colony stimulating factors are hence produced by cells participating in the inflammatory response. And this production of factors results in improvement in the host defense against infection. So far, several colony stimulating factors have been cloned and introduced in clinical trials. Two recombined proteins, GCSF and GMCSF, are now approved by the Food and Drug Administration for cancer patients and are currently being tested to expand their use into other applications. In 1987, Peter, a 69-year-old patient with incipient Alzheimer's disease, painted this picture of his native Holland. Every year thereafter, as Peter's dementia grew worse and worse, he was asked to draw the same picture of the windmill from his childhood. Thus, the steady march of Alzheimer's disease until death. Hello. I'm Dr. Ron Pion, host of Milestones in Medicine. And I'm Dr. Linda Bernstein, host of Pharmacy Rounds. We're proud to present this joint Milestones in Medicine Pharmacy Rounds series on Alzheimer's disease. The precursor protein is then cleaved to generate beta amyloid. And beta amyloid appears to be a toxic product to nerve cells. Other non-anticholinergic antidepressants are sertraline and bupropion. Sedative hypnotic and anti-anxiety agents are also useful in Alzheimer's disease. As academic and industry investigators focus intently on this disabling disease, we're hopeful that effective primary treatments will be available in the future. Thank you for joining us for this Milestones in Medicine Pharmacy Rounds program. Can you identify the pitfalls of polypharmacy encountered in this patient? How many medications constitute too many? Four? Five? Ten? When does even one unnecessary medication transform the cure into the curse of polypharmacy? Could any of this patient's problems have been avoided? Certainly, many situations exist where multiple medications are justified in order to achieve effective pharmacotherapy. A recent study showed that in an elderly population who have chronic medical diseases and who receive prescriptions free of charge, unrelated disorders were undertreated. As clinicians, you must strike a delicate balance between over and under prescribing, for both can result in a potentially increased risk of morbidity and mortality, particularly among our most vulnerable populations, namely the very young and very old. Polypharmacy is preventable once you understand the nature of the problem, contributing factors, and take steps to avoid it. This is Avoiding the Pitfalls of Polypharmacy with Dr. Linda Bernstein, Clinical Professor at the School of Pharmacy, University of California, San Francisco. Welcome, I'm Dr. Linda Bernstein, your host for today's program. Seizure emergencies do more than just create anxiety among family members and patients. They are associated with a high incidence of morbidity and mortality if not treated rapidly, sometimes causing permanent injury to the patient's brain and the body. Therefore, prompt and appropriate treatment aimed at producing a favorable outcome is crucial to avoid serious complications. In this program, we will explore the various types of seizure emergencies. We will look at the importance of quick assessment and initial management of the patient as well as examine the role of pharmacologic therapy based on the type of seizure. Seizure emergencies like epilepsy itself can be complicated. It can be challenging to immediately rule out other causes and arrive at an accurate diagnosis. Pharmacological therapy should be used without delay to control these episodes. Drug management of severe seizures is a fast evolving area and new information is beginning to redefine existing paradigms for therapy. Many EMTs now use standing protocols to administer drug therapy in the ambulance before the patient arrives in the emergency department. At that time, your immediate interventions in the ED will make the difference in long-term outcomes for these patients. With prompt and effective management using appropriate anti-epileptic drugs, these patients can have a good prognosis.